I don't think gluten is evil. If somebody has leaky gut syndrome, I really believe the best diet for them is actually a very similar diet that I follow now, and that is Looking for a better sleep? Try Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizers and get seven forms of magnesium in each capsule. Click the link in the description or pinned comment to save 10%. Josh, as somebody who has so much extensive knowledge and background in the alternative health and wellness space, we could really jump off with this conversation into any realm and, and go deep. But where I've decided to start is with collagen. You've taken the time, you've, write a, you've written a book about collagen. And this is just such an important topic because I think it's something that's easy enough for people to, you know, take on and, and bring into their, their health and wellness routine, and it's going to have such a great impact. So let's start off talking about what collagen is and why it's so important. Yeah, Jesse, you know, I get a lot of questions about collagen, obviously. My, my passion for things like collagen were born out of bone broth. Like I've spent a good part of my career studying ancient superfoods, and this was really born out of my mom fighting and overcoming cancer, right? So when she had this life-threatening issue, I spent time doing research for what are the most healing foods on the planet? What are the best things for fighting cancer? What are the best things for healing gut health, where our health starts? What are the best things for uh, you know fighting inflammation? And that's really what led me to bone broth as an ancient superfood we weren't getting. And one of the things that I was really uh, stunned by when I learned this fact many years ago is that one third of all of the protein that makes up your body is collagen. So we're talking about a large part of your body. So think about this, your skin, hair, nails, your bones. So think about this, you have more collagen in your bones than all other minerals combined, than all calcium, than way more than calcium. Um, you've got more collagen, like collagen makes up 90% of your ligaments, your tendons, your connective tissue, a lot of the things that hold up your organs, literally the glue that holds your body together, your gut lining, probably about 70% or so of that gut lining is made of collagen. So, you know, when I started doing this research, and by the way, even when a woman is creating a child, the placenta, a big part of that is made of collagen and blood. So when we look at the importance of collagen, it is critical to the body. I had a question recently from somebody when I was doing a Instagram Q&A. And somebody said, hey, I know our body can create collagen on its own. If that's the fact, then why do I need collagen in my diet? Well, the truth is, is we produce a lot less over time. And I would think about it like this. Now, many years ago, I, and still today, I do some weightlifting. Many years ago, I did a lot more than I do now in my 40s. But I am, um, you know, I, it's a principle that if you want to build muscle, you need to get more muscle building proteins. Okay. When you look at bodybuilders or people in the fitness industry, they consume a lot of protein, both animal, maybe some plant. So a lot of muscle building protein, which tend to be something called branch chain amino acids and another one called methionine. These are amino acids that are good for building muscle. Um, and so we know it's an absolute fact that if you want to build muscle, you need muscle building proteins. The exact same principle is true if you want to build up collagen, if you want to have glowing, healthy, beautiful skin, if you want to reduce cellulite, which is kind of a weak collagen matrix, if you want to improve gut health, you need more collagen in your diet. So that's why I love collagen. Now, there are some other cofactors and other nutrients that support collagen production, like vitamin C. Um, and Actually, some of the other things in bone broth also support collagen production, like glucosamine, chondroitin, hyaluronic acid. These all support collagen, zinc to a degree, certain antioxidants reduce your body from losing collagen. So all that being said, what I found was is collagen is critical. Here's the other thing to think about collagen that I think is so important to note. We talk a lot about micronutrients. We talk a lot about phytonutrients. Macronutrients are carbs, fats, and proteins. Now, those are really essential. Like, if you have, think about this, you know this too. If you have zero fat in your diet, zero, what does that do to your brain? What does that do to your cells that are all made up of fat? They deteriorate over time. So, there are certain things you have to have in your diet for your body to be healthy, especially macronutrients like fat and protein. Now, there really are no essential carbohydrates. They're just essential fatty acids and essential amino acids or 
you know, also really all amino, we, we need a lot of different amino acids. So proteins and fi- fat are essential to your organings, fun- your organs functioning properly, your body healing properly. So that's why I think it is so critical for so many people to be getting collagen in their diet because it's like an essential fatty acid, like an omega-3 fat. If you don't get enough, your body suffers. Now, there is a ratio that came out years ago. Dr. Uh, Sears wrote a book, B- Barry Sears. And it was all about the balance of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, right? Because if you have too much omega-6 fats, you have a lot of inflammation. Omega-3 fats reduce inflammation. They said it should be about a 1 to 1 to 1 to 4 ratio. I think we're seeing a very similar thing with the difference between collagen proteins and muscle proteins. There should be somewhere in between a 1 to 3 to 1 to 4 ratio. And that makes sense, right? Because one-third, 33% of all the protein that makes up our bodies our collagen proteins. Our ancient ancestors got it via bone broth. That's probably still my main source today, but I do supplement with a collagen supplement too. And actually I take a bone broth powder. I do both. I did both this morning in a breakfast smoothie to make sure that I'm getting a lot of collagen in my diet. Before we move forward, you've mentioned bone broth here a few times along with collagen. I think for people who are new to this, especially, you know, you can kind of see those words used interchangeably. So let's talk about the difference between bone broth, collagen, and then the other one that often gets lumped into that too is gelatin. You know, I think about it like this, using omega-3 fats as an example. The food-based source of collagen or or the food-based source of omega-3s is typically wild-caught fish, whether it be salmon or cod liver oil, mackerel, sardines. You know, these are a source of omega-3s. Now, chia, flax you know, DHA oil from seaweed or certain things too, caviar, like those are other sources too that you'll find in supplements today. Bone broth is history's collagen supplement. I mean, it's it's, it's actually 90% or more collagen by weight. I mean, so, so, so bone broth literally is a collagen, you know, it's a collagen superfood. Um, and so that being said, I think, you know, uh, the reason I bring it up is, is that it's the essential collagen supplement. Okay, and what about gelatin? Yeah, so so gelatin, you know, a lot of gelatin is taken from, and by the way, the benefits are going to be essentially identical. Um, g- gelatin oftentimes is taken from the hooves of, of, of animals, okay? Um, whereas bone broth tends to be taken by taking the, the ligaments, tendons, the collagen-rich um, parts of an animal, like a chicken, for instance, chicken feet, and necks are the highest in collagen. So you put those in a, you know, in a pot, you simmer them and those become liquid soluble. You drink those. And so, and, and you, they're, they're to a degree, gelatin is really just the, uh, it's just a different form of collagen. It's going to be more gelatinous in its texture where a lot of collagen su- supplements today, they're known as hydrolyzed. So they're made very sort of, uh, they're just made more water soluble. Uh, a lot of it's just sort of, semantics there's not in terms of benefits i don't really think there's much of a difference at all when it comes to benefits from collagen one important thing i learned from reading your book on it is that there's different forms of collagen so people might you know get get into a routine and start incorporating collagen into their smoothies in the morning or into their coffee or tea but maybe they're they're stuck on you know chicken collagen that's made from what is it the chicken egg part of the chicken egg yeah so so yeah so there's a there's different sources of collagen right yeah that's what i want you to riff on here talk about the different sources and how they all have different types of collagen that have different benefits yeah so so you've got different sources of collagen just like you could have different sources of uh amino acids via protein from different you know animal products so when we're talking about collagen you've got uh, the most popular today is bovine collagen that's from beef um, when we source it for the company that I, I'm, I, I uh, founded, we source grass-fed beef from areas like uh, South America and some from Europe and sometimes some from New Zealand we have in the past too. Um, so, so we find grass-fed sources of collagen. So bovine is one. It's higher in type 1 and 3 collagen. You also have wild fish collagen. That's going to be found in fish skins. Okay, so the skin, just like our skin of humans is 90% collagen, the skin of fish is 90% collagen. And so fish skin is going to be very, very high in collagen, uh, very high in type 1 and 3 as well. Chicken collagen is type 2 collagen primarily. Now it has some 1 and 3 and, and, uh, in there as well. 
But um, that's a really unique form of collagen. And by the way, chicken bone broth is really what also has those other things I mentioned earlier, which is the glucosamine, the chondroitin, and the hyaluronic acid that have all of these tremendous benefits for boosting your body's own collagen production as well. And so type 2 collagen is primarily what makes up your connective tissue. So your ligaments, your tendons, your, uh, you know... Um, you know, anything that's like a lot of times holding up and supporting some organ systems, your fascia, for instance, uh, those are going to be type 2 collagen. Eggshell membrane, so if you ever crack open an egg, there's a little thin film inside of it. That form of collagen uh, is really tremendous. It has, the, it's the most diverse form of all collagen sources. And so it's got type 5, type 10, I think type 9, type 1, 2. It's got, it's got like seven different sources of collagen. Uh, in this one or more in this one in, in this one um, collagen source and in clinical studies just 500 milligrams a day has been shown to be highly anti-inflammatory so the benefits of eggshell membrane and also in clinical studies it's been shown to decrease the appearance of crow's feet so if anybody's getting sort of those you know certain wrinkles it helps with those it helps with skin tone uh, it helps with joint recovery for athletes because of its anti-inflammatory and collagen supporting benefits. So so that so when I'm personally buying a collagen supplement, I am very much looking for one that has chicken both chicken collagen and eggshell membrane collagen because I think those are the two most unique forms that offer the greatest potential benefits in comparison. Now listen, your body is going to take collagen, break it down into amino acids and then use those same amino acids to rebuild your body's own collagen. Um that's sort of how that works, and it'll work with vitamin C and other things to kind of help your body do that. Um, but uh, but I think when somebody's buying a collagen, they should look for a collagen that has multiple, so like a multi-collagen protein, multiple sources, and specifically that eggshell membrane and, um, and, and chicken collagen. You just explained there quickly how when our body takes collagen in, it actually breaks it down to amino acids, and then in the body rebuilds that into our own collagen. I'm curious then, what would be the difference if somebody was to take collagen as a supplement or in food form versus, t say, taking like an amino acid supplement or protein powder that is a non bone broth source? So, and, and this is where myself and my business partner, Jordan Rubin, have really, this is something we've been preaching for a long time, is taking food-based supplements and taking things that resemble food. When somebody is creating a supplement, uh, let's start off using magnesium, for example. There are probably hundreds of forms of magnesium or could be there could be probably more than that but there, there's a lot okay so in somebody somebody could take probably the most common one today is magnesium citrate okay um magnesium citrate uh it's magnesium plus citrate right so so sometimes you have these amino they'll, they'll attach amino acids to these nutrients because your body will recognize them more possibly as food, utilize them in different ways. There's magnesium threonate. There's, there's all these different, there's magnesium chelate, which sometimes you'll take magnesium and you'll attach multiple amino acids. So, right, so what supplement companies will tr do uh, is they try and take a vitamin and make it look more, appears to your body more like a food so it can better utilize it. And sometimes your body needs these amino acids or other cofactors to actually help your body use it at all. Like, for instance, there's a type of calcium today taken from limestone, and this is most cal many calcium supplements called calcium carbonate. And this calcium oftentimes is not absorbed by the body. In fact, listen to this. This is mind-blowing. There are studies, and you can look this up. Just do a, 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 a search on Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever search engine you use, and just search calcium calcification artery study or calcium supplement side effects dangers and you'll be like, what? It, it is unbelievable that a lot of these synthetic vitamins today have side effects because, again, the calcium, it's not natural. Uh, your body, you ingest it, and your body's like, this is not natural. It actually can get lodged in your ar arteries, causing calcification of your arteries. So all that being said, what supplement manufacturers will do is they try and, and they'll do testing and research to find what form of a nutrient is most absorbable for, for, by the body, and they'll try attaching different amino acids. Now, the other thing that happens is magnesium citrate is the one that typically is used the most 
to support bowel movement. So if somebody's struggling with constipation, citrate or calm magnesium helps relax your muscles and your, your muscles by the body and allows your bowels to more readily move. So that's a form used for that. Whereas maybe like a magnesium three and eight might be used more for, uh, let's say something like um, blood sugar support. And it affects your pancreas more because that area is going to absorb it more due to the amino acid. I'm not trying to get real scientific, but, but, but my, my answer is, is this, is that I think the best form is always the form God put it in, the one in nature. You know, I just, I, I, I think that when you are taking a bone broth supplement, it's just pure and natural. It's got certain minerals. It's got other, like, it, it's, it's a certain ratio. It's, the body recognizes it, it utilizes, it. there's no side effects. I think sometimes when you try and trick the body or, or you try and do things that are more natural, it's better, but it's not as ideal as if you were getting something in a food form. So what I love, at least the ancient nutrition, the company that I founded, what we do is we just take bone broth, literally, we just make bone broth and we pull out the water. And then you add water at home and you have bone broth. And so it's that. Or we take a collagen supplement where we take the skin of animals, like a fish skin, uh, or that eggshell membrane. Um, and we essentially just, you know, pulverize it into a powder that is now. So, so all that being said, I think that's the big difference. I think when you're using synthetic nutrients, I, I just don't think you have the same absorption rate for one. You know, people say you are what you eat. I don't think that's completely true. You are what you absorb, right? If you're not absorbing things, you have... And, and we've seen this, right, with studies. If somebody doesn't have a healthy gut microbiome, their absorption rates of iron, zinc, magnesium, a lot of nutrients, B12, you know, those, 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 those levels are very low. So I do think getting things in the most natural form that your body can recognize and absorb is, is, is really, really important. It's an important thing for, for people to understand when they're buying any type of supplement. That makes sense. Always coming back to the whole food form as, as much as you can. Yeah. Josh, you touched on something there. We got to go a bit deeper into, because I'm sure a lot of people listening or watching right now are taking a calcium supplement. And this is something maybe their doctor recommended and and a lot of times this gets recommended to women as they age to keep their bone density up. So now you're telling people, uh oh, you know, this could be clogging up my my vessels and, and causing other issues. Does it come back to the whole food piece again and finding good sources in whole food form of calcium? Or what do you say to somebody, especially those special populations who need maybe a bit more calcium than the average person? Well, everyone has these people in their lives, right? I'm just going to give you an example of something that happened recently. My mom, uh, and, and by the way, you know, I get so many questions. I can't answer all of them. But when your mom asks, you kind of have to, you know. So I, uh, my mom sent me a, a text and she said, hey, I have a friend. She has osteoporosis. Can you tell her what to do? And so the first thing it is, I just sent her a message and I said, um, yeah, mom would love to, of course. Here's a few things she could do. And the first thing is food is medicine. So I always recommend food first. And then I recommend lifestyle medicine. And I always try to get to the root cause of the problem. So when somebody is, is developing osteoporosis, they're losing bone density. And when that, the bone density loss is going to be due to a loss of certain nutrients. And also, when you don't put enough pressure on the, on the bone, it, it, it'll lose it as well. It's like if you don't use a muscle, you lose it, right? You lose the strength of, of it. So, so what I recommended was I, I gave her a list of the top bone building foods she could consume. Number one is bone broth because your bones are made up of collagen. Okay. So that was number one, drink bone broth. Number two was celery. Celery actually in Chinese medicine, think about this, do this next time you buy celery, hold up the stalk to your forearm. Celery actually looks like your bones. There's a principle in Chinese medicine, it's called like supports like. If it looks like it, it supports it, okay? And I could go through this later. We could get into all this with TCM. It's absolutely incredible. I'd love to share that. But just if, for, for the sake of this, that's one. So I, I said, let's do celery. It's so high in minerals. Uh, it's very high in electrolytes, which is what your bone, big part of what your bones need. So that was number two on the list. Then I said green leafy vegetables. You know, lots of green leaf, leafy spinach, kale, the whole list there. 
And then I said some, uh, you know, some animal based products. We need some things there that, that I think would be beneficial, like wild salmon, for instance, would be very good. Uh, and then and then I said, uh, you know, raw cheese would be good. Um, now you don't have to have, you know, the dairy is always, uh, in, I said raw sheep and raw goat cheese. So not cow, actually sheep and goat, I think are more, more, absor more easily digested the nutrients in there. Um, and so I gave her those things, a few other things. And I told her a few supplements. I said, I would take a vitamin D3 with, with K. And then you can take a food based bone builder supplement that might have, you know, calcium, magnesium, boron, um, you know, some of those other things that are going to help, help, help build bones. Um, and then I recommended, Hey, start doing some light weights. I knew the age of the person, they were in their sixties. And I said, Hey, just get these five pound dumbbells. And I just want you to also just go on a walk just, just every day for 20 minutes. And then the other thing I said was this fear is the emotion in Chinese medicine that most affects your adrenal glands. But your adrenals are very closely with all of the cortisol, epinephrine, those stress hormones. When those are released, Part of what happens is that also actually does affect your body in a way to where you lose bone density. High cortisol, high stress hormones will cause people to lose bone density over time. And so I really warned her against spending too much time watching the news. Anything that builds fear or can cause those adrenals to get really stressed, I also cautioned against that and talked to her about that. Um... And then I had her take, you know, supplement wise, again, I, I mentioned this, you know, a collagen supplement. I mentioned the vitamin D with K2. I mentioned the bone builder. And those were, those were the big things that I, that I, that I had, I had mentioned to her. Have you ever followed either this person or somebody else through a similar protocol like that to see if over time they maintain their bone density or build it up again? Because again, coming back to the doctor and the pressure to take a calcium supplement, that can be scary. And that can be a lot of pressure coming from the doc, especially if you've already lost some bone density. So I'm curious on, do we have any, any examples of people that have been able to, to use this to their oh, advantage? I mean, I, many times, I mean, I've had so many patients in the past when I, when I, when I had a full-time clinic, which I don't anymore. If anyone needs a good practitioner, I know lots of them. Dr. Chris Motley, my brother, Dr. Jordan Axe, Will Cole's a good buddy of mine. So, so there's lots of good functional medicine practitioners. Uh, all that being said, so when I practiced, I saw you know, thousands of people reversing diabetes, reversing osteoporosis, reversing numerous conditions, heart disease. And then, and then I still hear from people today. Now I don't take care of any patients today. I just family referrals, right. You know, from it, where I just offer some advice and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. But yeah, I mean, I've seen plenty of people reverse their, uh, uh, re 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 reverse those numbers. Um, that's, yeah. And, and if somebody wants to find that you can just go online and, in search on a search engine. Google is not the best search engine anymore. It's very interesting. People don't know this. Google is a tech slash pharmaceutical company. And so the things that they actually, they, so natural health websites are harder to find today because Google has given so much preference to medical websites that run drug ads. And because they want people to stay in this medical model, and that's not a, that's not a theory. It's just look it up. I mean, they took Glasgow. Look up Google Glasgow Smith and Klein deal. And again, they own pharmaceutical companies. So of course, it makes sense for them to want to lead people in that direction. All that being said, use a search engine like DuckDuckGo or Brave, and you can search things like um, how to reverse osteoporosis with nutrition, or I reversed my osteoporosis with food and supplement. Look those things up, read those stories and you'll, you'll you'll find exactly what I'm talking about. There are thousands and thousands of people who have who who have reversed their chronic health conditions using food as medicine. Let's come back to the collagen piece and for somebody listening who is convinced that you know this is something I want to at least experiment with and try incorporating. Let's go to somebody who's a plant-based eater. And we did talk about the the inside of the eggshells, the membrane there, which could be a good option if somebody's a vegetarian. But what about for vegans? And I know you talked about vitamin C being a cofactor, so I'm assuming that may have a role here. But talk about what the plant-based people can do to up their collagen. Yeah, well, I, let, let me talk about all three, right? If somebody if somebody is a is a meat eater, uh, carnivore, omnivore, you, you know, if, if somebody's a meat eater. And then we'll get into these other two. Your best bet is to do bone broth and collagen. You can drink regular bone broth. You can take bone broth protein. You can take a collagen protein. I would aim for about 20 to 40 grams a day. Okay. 
And your first 30 days, you could double up. I mean, I've seen people just, just incredible results with literally, I mean, their, their wrinkles, I'm not going to say disappear, just lessening though. I mean, their skin looking so much better, their joints feeling better, their gut improving radically by just doing a serving or two of bone broth or collagen a day or what, what I do, one scoop of each. So, so that's number one. Number two, and I think this is great, Jordan Rubin, uh, the co-founder with me of Ancient Nutrition, I just created a vegetarian collagen supplement. And so this is made with a plant-based, a very unique thing that supports plant-based collagen and that eggshell membrane. And this is something that was inspired by a friend of mine, uh, Carrie Underwood. And so Carrie, uh, Carrie and, and uh, Carrie Underwood Fisher and Mike Fisher are friends of uh, my wife, Chelsea, and I. And we were having them over for dinner. And we both live in Nashville. And we're having this conversation. And so based on her, like we inspired us, we created this. Uh, vegetarian collagen, which is released any time now, very, very soon, which we are really excited about. Uh, and, and and it is also j- just what we're using with the ethical sourcing. And people, A lot of people don't know this. We own uh, over 4,000 acres of regenerative land where we're uh, reducing ca- the you know carbon uh, footprint. Um, it's, it's amazing. So now to, if somebody is a very, very ultra strict vegan, and they won't do any animal products, including things like honey, right? Or anything that has a face or, or, or won't do, you know, you utilize an eggshell or something like that. Th- th- then what, what they need to be doing is they need to be very conscious, number one, of their amino acid intake. They need to be getting a good amount of protein. So they really need to probably be getting, um, a lot of vegetables, a lot of berries, a lot of nuts and seeds, a lot of, of course, grains that are higher in protein. Quinoa is great. Rice. Um, but, but they want to get as much as they can. Mushrooms are fantastic. But the big thing in Chinese medicine is to increase your intake of things that spare collagen and that also increase stem cell production. Okay. Stem cells are predominantly what you're going to utilize for healing found in your bone, your bone marrow, and it can turn into anything. So it can turn into new skin cells, new joint cells, new, you know, liver cells, and um, and certain nutrients help with stem cells. Turmeric is one of those. Okay, uh, matcha green tea, uh, any herb that supports uh, act as an adaptogen like ashwagandha, uh, shisandra, romania, reishi mushroom. These are going to also help that to a degree as these adaptogens. And then along with those adaptogens, those things that spare collagen. Because the, the thing is, you don't only want to build it; you want to stop yourself from losing it. And antioxidants are tremendous at that. Berries like goji berry, maki berry, acai, pomegranate, resveratrol, found in things like blueberries, those are going to help spare it. Uh, And then turmeric and and matcha green tea are also going to help. So I think all those things. Now, the traditional collagen supporters in Chinese medicine are things like horsetail. Horsetail is very high in silica. Horsetail is not an actual horsetail necessarily. It's it's an herb, okay? Um, But that helps with that. So horsetail nettles, uh, reishi, um, all of those are going to help to a degree. But I would say eat a diet. If you're a vegan, it, again, it's a lot of vegetables and berries, amino acids, th- things that are high in protein that are plant-based, spirulina, chlorella, things like that. Um, and then taking, you know, taking some of these supplements that are going to help with stem cell production and keep you from losing collagen. So a lot of antioxidant rich foods, that's sort of going to be your best bet. But I do think this vegetarian collagen from ancient nutrition for those that are willing to use an eggshell um, as their source, along with the other plant nutrients in there that are also supportive of collagen, that's going to be a really fantastic solution. That's amazing. And for somebody who's listening right now and saying, you know, these collagen supplements, they sound great, but this is a relatively new thing. We never had these over, you know, the hundreds of thousands of years of revolution. Talk about why they're so important now because of our dietary changes over the years. Well, you know, I I, I think this is that when we look at what medicine is now compared to 150 years ago, even. It's very d- different, right? If somebody would go into anywhere in Asia or the Middle East, let's say for, uh, uh, let's go back 150 years and then let's go back even the past 3,000 years and let's say we would open somebody's medicine cabinet. What would you have found in there in Japan or China or Israel? You would have found herbs, spices, 
mushrooms, glanulars. Those are the biggest sources. Uh, and then the biggest thing they would also use, though, it was food, right? Hippocrates is famous for saying over 2,000 years ago, food is medicine. He recommended bone broth. He recommended things like apple cider, like, like vinegars. Uh, he recommended sunbathing, all kinds of things, or not eating, a lot of fasting. And so all that being said, I, I really, I, I think that when we go back and say, hey, what would a very wise ancient physician have recommended, they would have recommended rest and food as medicine. And so I, uh, you know, if somebody is eating, um, you know, if somebody is sick, the, 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 the meal that I recommend is chicken soup. So homemade chicken bone broth and ginger herbal tea in a lot of cases. Um, and that's just food. That's not a supplement. Now today, you know, we're really blessed to have access to these more concentrated uh, forms of superfoods. And even like my, the supplement company that I own, Ancient Nutrition, like we hardly have something that's, that's uh, even, that you actually couldn't in a way consider a food. Bone broth is a food. Our collagen is literally a food. Our green superfood is just spirulina and the world's greatest superfoods. And, you know, uh, and, and we have turmeric, we have ashwagandha, we have elderberry, we have echinacea, we have reishi mushroom, we have all of these different things you know, probiotics from the soil that we used to get in our diet, right? I think the big thing is today, we're, we're, they're just things we're missing more of than usual. You know, when, when I look at our diet of our ancient ancestors, there's a few big things missing. We eat a lot less herbs and spices, okay? So when you're cooking in the kitchen, load up on those herbs and spices. We get a lot less bone broth. That's a fact. Our ancestors, if they were eating meat, they were eating broth. They, they didn't let a single part of an animal go to waste. Today, we go and just buy the breast, the muscle meat of a chicken or a filet or, you know, whatever it is. Same thing with fish. And, and, and we're not utilizing, we're just using the muscular part. They, our ancient ancestors, they would eat the organ meats like liver. And they would utilize it to make broth to get all those nutrients and to get more more nourishment. So, so all that being said, you know, I, I think that it's not that things are radically different. I just think that a lot of times we're getting now these superfoods in, uh, in, uh, you know, more convenient forms due to the lifestyles we're living today. Um, but I, I still think the best supplements are the ones that have been used for thousands of years that you would have gotten in an ancient apothecary many years ago. And again, you'd go in there, you, you know, what most people consumed was tea. It was herbal tea. Hey, I'm going to do ginger tea. I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to do uh, a mushroom, actually, coffee or tea. Um, and then I'm going to take glanulars. You know, th th this is well documented uh, in Chinese medicine that if you had a liver problem, you would go in and you would take a you would take liver of an animal to support your own liver. That's that like supports like principle. So um, I don't think actually what I suggest is is actually very much different than um, what Hippocrates or Maimonides would have recommended, you know, uh, in the past. You covered there and highlighted what I was hoping you go deeper into. And that's the fact that these days, even a lot of people that are eating healthy, and I've been guilty of this as well, you know, I'm really uh, cautious about only eating wild fish and organic meats and, and grass fed meats. But, you know, even just eating those all the time, it's easy enough not to eat, like you talked about, the organs and getting what we're getting, these unique nutrients that are in collagen. So I want to highlight the fact that if you are eating a diet like I just talked about, very clean meats, but they're all muscle meats, collagen can be an easy way to supplement that and round things out. It's, it's relatively inexpensive and it's easy to take. And it's just, I think it's a key. And that's why I wanted to start and, and now we've really drawn it out, which is great. Talk about this because I think it can be a real game changer for people. Well, I think the other thing is too, right? Your body has many different needs. Your body needs muscle building protein. It needs collagen building protein. It needs essential fatty acids. It needs specifically omega-3s. It needs omega-6s. It needs omega-9s. It needs healthy saturated fats because that's what makes up your brain. Uh, it needs antioxidants. It needs vitamins. It needs minerals. It needs probiotics. It needs a lot of different things, right? So if somebody's eating a diet where they're only eating the same two foods every day, 
their their their, their body is pr- typically going to be missing something. And this is why also throughout history, people have eat uh, have been eating seasonally. You know, seasonal eating and eating what's ripe typically in season allows your allows you to typically get a greater range of certain foods. And also the way I think this is incredible how God created the planet is that the foods that are in ripe in season tend to be the ones that are most nourishing for your body at that time. So get more into detail. Talk specifically from your example as you go through different seasons throughout the year. And I believe you're in uh, Tennessee, so you will have different seasons there. Talk about how your diet will change throughout the year. So, so there's five main seasons in Chinese medicine. Okay, uh, let's start with spring. You know, spring is when things uh, start growing again. They're green, right? So, so that's the time of eating a lot of green foods and really upping your eat, eat, eating even more vegetables, lots of lettuces, getting salads, getting those herbs that are bitter, those sort of things, and things that are sour. So that's going to be very, very good in the spring uh, during during that season. You know, the summer, um, doing foods that are more red, things like coffee, uh, things like, well, in brown, um, coffee, beets, grass-fed beef, you know, those sort of foods. And a lot of those foods start getting ripe. Think about strawberries, right, in June, something like that. You're going to start, those are going to start getting ripe and ready. Um, the fall uh, is going to start being time to eat orange foods. So think about Thanksgiving even, or that early fall, you're getting pumpkin, butternut squash. Isn't isn't that weird? Like every fall, all of a sudden we start, we have cravings for pumpkin pie, turkey, pumpkin spice lattes, right? Like using more cinnamon and pumpkin pie spice. These are because that's what our body needs and it's craving in that season. The next we get into are white foods. These are foods that are more pungent. Um, This is going to be around Christmas time. Uh, and, and when it's cold and flu season. So we're talking about ginger, garlic, chicken soup, foods that are light yellow or white. So garlic is light yellow. Ginger is light yellow. Chicken bone broth is light yellow. Miso soup, that's light yellow, right? So we've got all these things that are light yellow that are strengthening of the immune system at that time that you want to be doing. Um, and then we come into the season of kind of that January, February time period, and that's known at the time of the water element. That's when you all should spend more time in meditation, going deep because you can't be outside, but just really reflecting on your life. That's that New Year's resolution time. And you want a lot of things that are that blue and purple color, very, very dark, nutrient rich, um, blueberries, black rice, you know, th- those sort of things are going to be are going to be good in that time. And then you know, a lot of the canned goods, things like that, even getting your li- prepping your liver to get ready to go. So a little bit of those fermented sour foods more so in the winter as well. And personally, how far do you take this? You mentioned the strawberries there in the summer. If you can get, say, like imported organic strawberries in the winter from Mexico or California, is that something you'll consume periodically? I think it's fine. I, you know, I, I think it's fine. I, I think I'm just conscious, right? I'm not perfect. I'm just conscious. I'm conscious that uh, right now, now I spend time in Nashville every year, but I also spending some time in Puerto Rico now and I'm in Puerto Rico now and it's very warm out. And in the winter in Nashville, I'm not con- drinking coconut water. It's very cooling. Uh, I don't typically need it. Now, if my body gets overheated, I'm in the sun a lot. I'll drink coconut water. Um, because it makes sense for my body at that time. So, so, uh, you, you know, I, I, I do eat seasonally and try and get things that are ripe in season, but it's not a rule for me. It's though that I'm conscious of, Hey, you know what? My body, our family right now, like, Hey, it's fall. We're going to make a homemade shepherd's pie, you know, with, with grass fed beef and peas and sweet, all those fall foods. Right. You know, it's just that like we're conscious. Hey, it's spring now. Hey, let's do some salads. Hey, I'm going to buy some fresh arugula and watercress and endive and, you know, some, we're going to do some vinegar on here and like, we're going to make some big salads in the spring. So I think just generally we're more conscious and try and get more of those foods, at least in the Axe household, my wife, Chelsea and I, and our, our daughter, Arwen. That makes sense. Talk more about this transition to Puerto Rico. This is news to me. I thought you were still in uh, Tennessee, Nashville. Uh, yeah, well, when did that happen? Her, I got this big, big wave behind me. We're spending time. Very cool. when, uh, when did, tell me when that happened and, and how is life different uh, living there? Yeah. So um, first of all, we love Nashville. We still spend a lot of time there. Uh, we just, we had a house in Florida for a time and loved it there. And then we came to visit Puerto Rico and just loved the Caribbean life. Like we have, we have a daughter right now that's two years old and um, 
uh, one of the things about our our house in Florida was we um, we were in the panhandle and really the panhandle is not that warm. Like we wanted, we're water people, just so you know. Like I grew up, my dad was a semi-pro water skier and we were on the water constantly. Chelsea's family was, and we just, every vacation I ever took, we went boating. Like we would rent houseboats with my cousins and we just spent a lot of time on the water. So we're water people. So we thought we'd come down here in the season of life when Arwen doesn't have to be in school and just spend some time in the weather down here. And uh, my in-laws came down here with us too, which was a real blessing and a lot of fun. So we're just spending time. So like my, uh, you know, once I get off work at later in the afternoon, um, you know, like we'll run down to the beach uh, or we'll swim or anyways, it, just spending a lot of time outdoors uh, is something that we really wanted to do a lot of over the next uh, couple of years, just until she gets in school. And then, you know, we'll, we'll see about settling back into Nashville again. But all that being said, it's been uh, uh, the weather being perfect every day down here and just as active as we are, as much as we love the water and just the season of life, having younger a younger child made uh, just made sense. Yeah, sounds incredible. And how's your access to food? I mean, we're talking about different herbs and superfoods. Is it a challenge to get a lot of that stuff to where you're at? At first, it was challenging, but we, we found a way. We make relationships with local farmers. We've got, uh, actually, I'll say this. In Nashville, we cooked a good amount, but we um, we had access to restaurants like True Food Kitchen. I mean, just some great restaurants. And so we would you know, we would eat out a little bit more. We've been making just most meals at home now uh, a lot. And so we've got used the crock pot a lot. And I love cooking. For me, it's the way I unwind, reduce stress. Like my my greatest passion outside of sort of health and, and, and leadership uh, and teaching those sort of principles is uh, is gourmet cooking. And so, you know, like last night, uh, we made uh, spaghetti and grass-fed meatballs. The spaghetti I made was made of this uh, gluten-free cassava uh, pasta. And then we made meatballs. We loaded up, we got fresh basil and parsley and, and, uh, used these flax crackers, uh, that we used in there. And, uh, so anyways, it's been, um, we, we found a way to, um, and, and by the way, Puerto Rico, uh, from what I've seen, and what I've heard, especially certain areas of the Island, the entire middle of it's a rainforest. Um, it's the closest thing to Hawaii that I've ever seen. I mean, just lush, beautiful. You drop something in the ground, it grows. So, uh, we're getting planters, uh, planted at my in-laws house who they live about a half mile down the street. We're going to grow some of our own food. I mean, fresh, fresh fruit, fresh food constantly. So, so really you got to know where to look, but once you look and find it, the access actually is, is fairly easy. Yeah. Sounds great. And you mentioned there gluten-free pasta. At this point, are you guys gluten free? No. Is that something you've played uh, around I, with I, over I, the years just, and kind I, of now introduce it periodically, or talk about the evolution there? Because I want this to lead into leaky gut, and I know you're an sure. expert in that area, and I'm curious on the impact of of gluten on the gut. And first, talk about your personal story with gluten, though. Um, I don't think gluten is evil. I don't think casein is evil. I don't th think sugar is evil. I think that anytime you get excess of something or more than the body can handle, it's a problem. And also certain people, their systems in their body, more and less at certain times, can handle more or less. So that being said, um, I actually digest now, now I have not had hybridized wheat to my knowledge, and I, I I couldn't even name one. Ten years, fifteen, maybe a year. I have no idea when. I, I I just I try and eat a lot of real food, and I try and eat a diet that's based more on Chinese medicine and learning what my body does well with, and also knowing certain seasons and all these things. So so I, I like I believe that there is no one perfect diet for anybody. I believe everybody is a unique individual. I believe some people thrive and do incredibly well on a keto diet. I think for others, it would be a terrible diet for them. I think some people can handle being a vegetarian or, or I'm sorry, or a vegan, but not most. So, so, so I really believe that it really depends on the individual person. 
and what their ancestors adapted to, what they have adapted to, the stressors in their life. So now on gluten, you know, uh, I, I developed digestive issues many years ago. Mine was primarily due to stress. It was working too many hours. Like this is when I first opened my clinic. And I was running a full-time functional medicine practice and scale and writing articles for DrAx.com and and teaching at seminars and all, you know, doing that 60 hours a week sort of work. And that caused more of my I developed leaky gut. Um, I backed off on the work. I met this incredible Chinese medicine doctor who gave me some advice, backed off on my work, spent more time relaxing, and boom, all my, my leaky gut went away. Now, at the same time, I also was more conscious of my food. He gave me some advice of drink, doing more bone broth, using astragalus as an herb, licorice root, um, you know, some other things, ginger, some things to help my gut heal. Um, but uh, but gluten for me has never been an issue. You know, I've promoted a gluten diet because a uh, gluten free with most people. Now, again, what I don't get gluten very often. Cassava doesn't have gluten. Um, I, I, I actually had a sprouted grain pizza crust, uh, the other night that we made homemade pizza and we did these maitake mushrooms, grass fed, uh, we actually did venison and bison. Uh, it was really good. Lots of basil. And then, uh, we did just a little bit of this, uh, local, like a sheep cheese, um, very light on it. And I found my body did really well with that, but it had some gluten in there. It had a sprouted wheat berry. Um, but um, all that being said, like I, I don't like the issue with gluten has become hybridized wheat, which has much higher levels of gluten. And then the fact that we don't ferment it or sprout it, which what that does is it helps break it down and make it more easily digestible. I believe throughout history, most people did fine with gluten if it was from a fermented or sprouted, sprouted grain bread. I think we have so many issues today because our di di digestive systems have already dealt with so much uh uh, with things like antibiotic drugs and chlorine in our drinking water and all of the other things that are hard to digest. So, so I think that's more of the issue. So just kind of last thought here on this. Um, I'm not gluten free. I'm very gluten minimal. I probably have gluten once a week and it's in a sprouted or a fermented form. Um, I may have grains every other day or something like that. I don't do grains as much either. And I found that for my body, I do well with a lot of cooked vegetables and a lot of wild organic meat. Those two things, meat and vegetables, are the basis of my diet. I also make a lot of homemade hummus. I will do a lot of berries. I do a lot of collagen and bone broth, like in a smoothie for breakfast. Like that's the basis of my diet. And then I'll sprinkle it and then a lot of coconut. That's sort of the main sort of fat I do. And my body does really well with that. Um, but everybody's different, right? My, my wife does not do very well with gluten. So she doesn't do much. Like I don't do well with dairy. Like if I do much dairy, I just nose runs. I have all kinds of issues. So I, I don't do well with dairy. She doesn't do that well with wheat. And we know that. And so we sort of cater our diet to that. I don't know if that helps answer the question. I know that's a really long answer. No, that's great. You gave a lot of personal uh, experience in there, which is great. I'm curious for somebody, though, who is consuming, say, hybridized wheat, and they're maybe not preparing it, you know, ideally and sprouting it. And, you know, you talked about sprouting grain there. In that case, can that lead to leaky gut? Yeah, well, again, anything that's hard on the gut, right? It, it, it's the thing about your gut is sort of this wall. You know, and you you always have people rebuilding it and building reinforcements. But if you're constantly attacking it, gluten's one thing, right? Let, let, let's say gluten's the only bad thing you have, though. The rest of your diet's perfect, and you have too much gluten that's from a hybridized grain. Your fortress, this wall may be strong enough where it never fully, completely breaks down, okay, to get the gap, that gap junction, that gap in that wall. You might be okay. But if you took antibiotics when you were a kid. There was already kind of a whole little hole there in the wall. And then you're not doing just the hybridized wheat. You're doing sugar. And then you've got a little bit too much stress in your life. And that cortisol's up. Boom, 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 boom. This wall comes down. And now all of a sudden, you can't absorb things. You're getting, you know, protein-like gluten. 
and bad bacteria and toxins and things like that that get into your bloodstream. And this causes an inflammation cascade and your body has an immune response to get rid of it. And then, you know, you, you develop leaky gut, which then turns into inflammation, which then, because you don't fix it, that turns into autoimmune disease, right? That's that vicious cycle and what starts to happen over time. So, so I do think most people and d definitely myself and my family, we, we don't really eat gluten especially any gluten that's hype. We, we don't eat any gluten that is hybridized. Um, and, uh, and, and we, we do well, but yeah, if some, let me say this. If somebody has leaky gut syndrome, I really believe the best diet for them is actually a very similar diet that I follow now. And that is cooked meat and vegetables, lots of soups, chicken, vegetable soup, beef soup, like lots of things like that. Bone broth, cooked meat, cooked vegetables, maybe some easily digested fruit, like pears, applesauce, blueberries, right? Like making, that is the makeup of the diet and then adding in some herbs like ginger and licorice root. Um, you know, taking a probiotic supplement, right? That and keeping that stress low, that, that's going to help heal leaky gut. Oh, that's great. And how common is leaky gut these days? I know you're not in clinical practice well, well, working well, with people like you were before, but how common would you say it is and then for somebody who, you know, has full blown, you mentioned it can get to autoimmune disease if this goes out of hand for a period of time, for somebody who is on that spectrum from, you know, just the beginning of leaky gut all the way to autoimmune disease, how, how much hope and how quickly can they heal us up doing something like you mentioned there? Well, one, there's always varying degrees, right? I would say a very severe form would be somebody that has major autoimmune disease and especially a digestive form like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease or, or IBS, right? Th those are very severe forms of, I, I, uh, of, of leaky gut, but, but also there's others, right? Migraine headaches tends to have a, a, a leaky gut component, um, seasonal or I'm sorry, food allergies and food sensitivities. There tends to be an issue there. Um, like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, right? Even there's an issue there. Uh, children who are on uh, have autistic spectrum disorders, um, they're going to have a lot of issues there uh, in most cases. And so all that being said, I think there are also varying degrees. You could have it minor, you could have it major. Um, but I would say, you know, 80% of people to some degree have some form of, of leaky gut syndrome. I mean, it's a very, very high number. You know, what people have it more severely to where it's really affecting their everyday lives, probably a quarter, I mean, 20, this is a big S and that's just an estimate, but probably 25, you know, quarter of people, a third of people. I mean, there, there's a lot of people I would say, yeah, I would say at least one in three probably likely have it to some degree, but a lot of people, um, again, it, it's a hard thing to answer because there's so many varying degrees. It's almost like asking, how many people have inflammation? Like that answers everybody, but what degree of inflammation? It is just such a spectrum that it is a hard thing to answer. I, I do think everybody, when they're eating, should be thinking of taking care of their gut because it's really where your health starts. And then also inflammation, right? I think those are really two key things people should focus on. And the other thing is blood glucose levels, keeping insulin balanced. You know, those, those are three things to absolutely, I think, keep in mind. Where's your blood sugar? Uh, where's your inflammation? And am I caring for my gut right now? I, I think all of those things are, are vitally important. Well, we got into deeply there how to go about healing the gut. Let's talk about the other two pieces there. You talked about blood sugar and inflammation. Sure. One at a time, let's get into each of these because they do affect so many people. What are some of the things people can do if they know they're suffering from chronic inflammation to start? With chronic inflammation, and by the way, the same diet I just shared is one that is going to help with inflammation as well. Meat and vegetables. That's the basis of your diet. And when I say meat, I mean wild organic meat, grass-fed beef, wild-caught fish like salmon, pastured chicken, those sort of things, bone broth, right? It's those things, and it's vegetables. Now, in addition to that, with inflammation, you want to have a greater focus on adding in herbs and omega-3 fatty acids. So you want to do a lot of things like turmeric, ginger, rosemary, galangal, 
Uh, but but those the, the, the three that, that are easy to get, you have them in your pantry almost always, turmeric, ginger, and rosemary, tremendous, tremendous benefits. So going very high, you can take one as a supplement um, and you can use them, you know, liberally in your food, you know, so, so that's, that's, that's what I would say to consider. And then taking an omega-3 supplement, uh, getting, eating more wild caught fish, lots of salmon, you could do a, you know, uh, grilled salmon, you could do uh, salmon patties, you know, made with something like flax crackers, which have additional omega-3 benefits, that sort of thing. But I would say really, that's what you want to focus on is vegetables, the omega-3s, the herbals. And then if you throw some fruit in there that's more low glycemic, like blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, I think those are going to have some, some, you know, so, so, some benefits as well. If you're going to add in some seeds, that flax and chia hemp are going to be okay as well. So, so that's going to make up a very anti-inflammatory diet, keeping the grains out, keeping most dairy products out, keeping most, especially, you know, processed oils. Your oil should really be coconut and olive oil. I think those are the two healthiest oils on the planet. It's the two that the only two you'll find in our, our cabinet that we just use constantly. Um, that, that diet will really help inflammation along with doing a lot of the herbs and omegas. Uh, from the standpoint of blood sugar, meat and vegetables, it's the same thing. Uh, some additional good fat, right? So lots of coconut, olive oil, avocados. Those are going to be good. But you really want protein, fiber, and fat. And the nutrients that help with blood glucose. A chromium is a really important micro mineral that helps. Um, if somebody has diabetes, it, it's, it's a good supplement to take. You could take chromium picolinate. Cinnamon is the herb that is probably the most beneficial for blood sugar levels. In addition to cinnamon, clove is very, very good. Fenugreek is amazing. In fact, if there are only two herbs somebody takes for blood sugar, cinnamon and fenugreek clinically have the most benefits. Holy basil is another good one that's going to have some good benefits there. But again, it's sugar. Sugar is going to be the problem there. And stress also has a tremendous, uh, causes a, a tremendous spike of blood sugar levels. Stress is big, big when it comes to insulin. And this is because in Chinese medicine, we know this too, different emotions affect different organ systems. The emotion of worry, that form of stress where you're worrying or overthinking or obsessed about anything where you're thinking all the time or or you're, or let's say you're on the computer and you're watching about the news constantly, something politically or something going on. And you're in that, and you're, that is so stressful. We don't even realize it. All that light we're looking at, all that news, that fear, that worry, it's driving into us. Worry affects the pancreas. So it affects your blood sugar. Whereas fear affects the adrenals. Whereas grief or a sense of loss or depression affects the immune system, your lungs and colon. Anger, resentment, hate, frustration, impatience, those affect the liver. And then you've got anxiety or nervousness. Those affect the heart, right? Blood pressure rises. So, so it's important to understand, too, how emotions affect all of the different organ systems. Because, because, again, I've said food is medicine, but you know what? It's not just food that's medicine. Food is medicine along with your mindset, your emotions, and your lifestyle. It's so critically important that people understand that. Let's come back to the doctrine of signatures. You talked about this earlier. You're giving the example of celery. I think it was when we were talking about building up the bones, somebody that might be suffering from osteoporosis. I want to make sure we come back and, and get into the details if somebody's interested in that. Talk more about what that is and how somebody can go about using that to their advantage. Well, I, I think, listen, I know everybody has different religious belief systems, but for me, I think uh, there's a there's a verse uh, in the Psalms that uh, King David quotes, and he says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And I think the earth does as well. You know, I, I think that there are specific things in our environment uh, that God put here for us to make it simple. We make nutrition more complex than it should be. Like, for instance, uh, the biggest thing, like the way that I know how to eat things, and, and I don't, I don't want to knock health practitioners um, for this, but it, might, it may sound like a little bit of a knock. I think it's just with people in general, though. People, what, what we're taught to do in schools today is memorize facts. We're not taught to think. So what I see when I speak on panels or I see a lot of these other, some people speaking and doing podcasts and all these other things, they're just reciting facts that they've learned. And I'm not saying I never do that. I, I'm guilty of that as well. 
But I think one of the things that I would encourage everybody to do, and especially doctors today, is think for yourself. Understand the principle. When you understand the principle of the way something works, it allows you to have a greater degree of understanding. And so, uh, you know, as an example of this, um, flavor, like, like what, what allows us to know what to eat is the flavor, the color, and the appearance of the food, okay? We know that different flavors impact different organ systems. Sour affects the liver. It causes the liver to, 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 uh, to cleanse. Bitter affects the liver to re reduce bile and affects the heart. It dries up bitter. Uh, it dries up things like candida and too much dampness in the body. We know sugar affects the pancreas, right? Everybody knows that sugar affects the pancreas. Um, so things that are sweet, things that are umami um, affects the immune system, garlic and ginger, right? So um, all that being said, when you know that principle, like, you know, oh, this is bitter. Okay, this impacts the heart, but also has an impact on some other organ system. So all that being said, when, when you look at foods that look like organs, they support those organs. It's, it's, a, it's a law of this world. I think God put them here so we know what to eat. For instance, you cut a carrot open and you look at it, it looks like an eye. And the ancients knew it supported eye health. But clinical studies prove the same thing. The studies show that carrots are loaded with beta carotene, a nutrient that supports eye health. You know, look at a tomato. This is amazing. A tomato, when you cut it open, actually has four chambers, four sections to it. Your heart has four chambers, has four sections to it. The heart is red. Tomatoes are red. Tomatoes are high in a compound called lycopene, which have been shown in clinical studies to be one of the greatest um, you know, fires of heart disease on the planet. Think about um, olives. They look like ovaries. Okay, they have unique polyphenols for reproductive health. Avocados look like a uterus. Avocados are high in magnesium potassium, which helps relax the muscles around the female organs and also certain monounsaturated fats, which are good for hormonal health. Think about beets. You cut open a beet, it's like blood is coming out. What is the number one superfood for blood health and for boosting nitric oxide levels? It's beets. It's incredible for your blood. You know, so, you know, and just to go through just a few others here, um, think about reishi mushroom. If you look up a reishi mushroom, it looks like your kidneys, which are where your adrenals sit. Reishi uh, mushrooms are the number one adre uh, adrenal tonic. They're great for your adrenal glands. Um, you know, a coconut looks like a head. It has a fluid inside. Your head is full of fluid called cerebral spinal fluid. So the electrolytes are incredible in coconut uh, for supporting your body's own fluids, including your cerebral spinal fluid. And then it has all of this fat in it, inside of it, which your brain is made up of mostly fat. And not just fat, saturated fat, like what's found in coconut. Think about a walnut. A walnut looks like a head. You crack it open. It has two sides, a left and right side. It looks like the left and right hemisphere of your brain. It's high in omega-3s and choline and vitamin E and all these nutrients that boost brain health. I have quite a few others, but just to say, it is incredible when you look at those foods, how they support those organ systems. You know, I don't see that being as a, co a coincidence. I see that as being, hey, you know, uh, God allowing nature to tell us how we, you know, what we should be eating to take care of ourselves and our own bodies. Um, so anyways, I just, I find that so fascinating. I cover that in my book, Ancient Remedies. If people want to check it out, they can go to Amazon and just search Dr. Axe Ancient Remedies. But I go through all of these different ancient ways of healing and different conditions and these superfoods and things like that in there. But, uh, when I was re writing that book, I, you know, rediscovered that principle. You started off there talking about how we often make nutrition more complicated than it needs to be, which I'll agree with. I'll also add to that we tend to give it more weight than it deserves. And I don't want to take away from the fact that it is foundational and it is important and we need to, you know, this is one of the main pillars, but this comes back to what you're talking about before, where you're talking about, you know, emotional health and, and, and peace of mind, exercise. There are so many different things that we could get into. And I find a lot of people, especially when they're new to the health and wellness space, will come in and, and put a lot of weight in the nutrition area 
but then possibly neglect these other areas. So I just want to highlight, which ties back to what you said before this. Yeah, well, well I, I would say, Jesse, you know, that um, emotional health is the most important aspect of your health, your emotion and mindset. It's more important than nutrition. Now, I think nutrition is number two, but I do think your emotional well-being, your mindset, this is why somebody could eat very unhealthy and still be health, and, and, and very unhealthy and actually live a long time and be fairly healthy in their life if they even eat moderately well and not near as good as someone else. So I do think that emotional health is the biggest. I think nutrition is a very close second to it. And then other lifestyle factors, getting good sleep, movement, right? Some of these other things I think are really important as well. But I do think being aware of your emotions. And listen, if you have a lot of fear in your life, do things that combat that fear. Build faith and hope in the future, right? Um, if you have a lot of grief and uh, maybe you're depressed, maybe you've, you're holding on to something from the past or unforgiveness, you need to work on letting that go and moving forward into the future. So healing your emotions is critical to healing, not only healing your soul and your spirit, but also your physical body. I know you got to go, but before we part ways, since you are an expert in Chinese medicine, we've talked about all these different herbs throughout our conversation. For somebody who this is a new piece for them, maybe they're already eating very clean, but they're not incorporating these herbs, you know, either in tincture or capsule or tea. This can be another big piece for them to add in in another layer. So for somebody who is new, because there is so many different ones and they have all different benefits, a lot of them are overlapping. What are, say, like, three to five different herbs somebody in the, the Chinese medicine realm can incorporate for general health and wellness? Yeah, and some of these are very popular, and I think they should be for good reason. If somebody's dealing with inflammation at all, joint issues, heart issues, uh, turmeric is, 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 one, is fantastic, very anti-inflammatory. If somebody's dealing with issues related to hormones, let's say thyroid issues or stress, ashwagandha is incredible. Uh, if somebody needs energy, they're just kind of tired frequently. I think um, matcha, green tea is very, very good as a natural uh, energy support. Somebody's having adrenal issues. I also like ashwagandha, but I also like herbs um, like ginseng and romania. If somebody has blood issues like anemia, a lot of women, by the way, young women, especially if you are having a lot of bleeding, um, during menstruation, I would say uh, Dong Kwai is incredible. Uh, PMS hormone imbalance, Vitex, uh, menopause symptoms, hot flashes, black cohosh, low testosterone in men, a combination of ginseng and fenugreek. It's very, very good. Um, I could go on and on and on. So, so there, there, there are a lot. Blood sugar, I mentioned, right? Cinnamon, fenugreek, those are good too. Uh, but I would say those are some of the top ones. And again, I cover these in detail with pretty much every condition you could ever think of in my that my Ancient Remedies book. But I uh, I would say those would be some of the, the, the top ones. Well, we talked about a couple of your books, Ancient Remedies again, and your Collagen Diet book. We're going to link up all the books in the show notes. We're going to link up your Instagram. Josh, we've done this a number of times. We covered a ton in this one, gave a lot of practical information. I want to thank you for coming back on the show. Well, Jesse, I want to say thanks for having me. And by the way, if, if I didn't cover a topic that you want to hear more about, um, I've written articles, I've done a lot of videos. So you can just go on search engine, whether it's Google or YouTube or another engine, just search Dr. Axe. For instance, if you have hypothyroidism, you can search Dr. Axe hypothyroidism. I've written an article on it. If you want to learn more about supplements like collagen, you can search Dr. Axe collagen. And uh, again, I co-founded Ancient Nutrition. I think uh, everybody would, uh, you, you can just learn more by going to ancientnutrition.com as well, checking out more there. And Jesse, I want to say, hey man, I'm a huge fan of the podcast. It's been fun. I think it's probably my third time on. Yeah, and, third or fourth. Uh, it's, I think fourth. It's, been, uh, it's been, been fun every time. So, All fourth. Right. so thanks again for having me. I always enjoy it too, Josh. I'm sure we're going to have many more and uh, all the best. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks.